Welcome back to uh, In Conversation with Trevor. This week, I am in conversation with uh, Alvord Mabena, the former general manager, CEO, and chairman of uh, the National Railways of Zimbabwe. Enjoy this part two of the conversation. <music> So, um, Albert, you then decided to go to England. Explain to us why you decided to go to England to study. Right. I've had, uh, by that time, I had uh, a pretty longish time uh, on what I can call the shop floor as an artisan. Then it occurred to me that uh, 40, 50 years down the line, I might like to uh, be doing something different and I foresaw that I won't have the energy and capacity to be doing the artisan work. So I decided that uh, I should advance myself and uh, go to university and uh, do further studies so that when I ultimately retire, I'll be doing a, a higher level uh, type of job. Mm. Had you seen anybody doing that, Alvord, or where did you get the inspiration that this is what I need to do? Were there push factors that made you think, let me go outside the country rather than uh, do it internally? Yes, I really wasn't pushed by anybody, Trevor. Somehow, I suppose that each person has got uh, their own individual attributes. Uh, in, throughout my life, I always try and project forward. And uh, even if I'm comfortable now, I, I ask myself, what is it going to be like 10 years time? Mm. Uh, what position will I be 20, 30 years time? So it was that, uh, along that timeline that I was following. Right. And I thought that I would be comfortable if I, I, I advance myself so that uh, when I ultimately retire, I would have achieved something. Mm. And uh, I think another, challenge uh, uh, Trevor at that time uh, from the Africans as they were called at the time it was uh, uh, unheard of that an African be an engineer because those were uh, uh, professions reserved uh, for the white establishment at the time. Mm. So uh, it, it just occurred to me that yes regardless of that I want to be an engineer Mm. Even if it means me being the first engineer, but that's what, that's what uh, is in my passion. Mm. Mm. So I decided that uh, I want to pursue a course in mechanical engineering mm. and have a degree in it. By that time, it really was a, a tall order to achieve. Mm. But uh, I set myself on that course. And uh, since then, I've never looked back. So you took a flight. You took a flight to um, to, to, to 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 London. Uh, to take us through that uh, journey. Yes, uh, it was after uh, quite some time of preparation uh, of paperwork, by way of uh, applying for a, a vacancy in in English universities, by way of uh, making uh, flight bookings, etc. So after all that was done, I therefore decided to abandon my my fleet of vehicles that I was uh, managing in, in one game. You decided game. to abscond, Albert. <laughs> I, I, I literally uh, I did that. <laughs> to be quite honest, I literally did that. Because I knew, it was clear to me that if I asked for a permission for my employer, he would not have allowed me. Mm. Uh, first point. Second point is, uh, they would have uh, thought, in fact, they, they were sure that any young African male going out of the country, they are going for guerrilla training. Mm. So they were all out to frustrate that. So that's why I kept it a secret from my employer and uh, put all my plans together individually. Mm. So I decided to uh, abandon uh, the, the fleet of trucks uh, in Wangi and took up a flight to 
uh, to draw back and, and route to London. Mm. When uh, the plane took off, I prayed in myself uh, to my God that I pray that my living God should uh, assist me so that I succeed uh, and achieve what I'm going out for. Mm. That was the prayer that I made. Mm. So we landed in South Africa and route. Uh, we were not very many uh, uh, young uh, blacks in that flight. So uh, for some reason, unfortunately, we were intercepted by the regime uh, because between the two regimes, uh, the Zimbabwe and South Africa, they thought all oh, these young Africans, again, they are going for guerrilla training. So between them, they decided to intercept us and they send, send us back. So while we are there uh, trying to work our way out, uh, we tried and phoned the uh, Zimbabwe embassy from uh, uh, Jobek, uh, London embassy, uh, to no avail. Until at the end of the day, we were put on a flight back to Zimbabwe. Mm. And I must say the whole world just closed in front of me. For a, now I just, for a young man who had absconded his employer, that, that, it, that must have been very humbling. Talk to us about that. Yeah, it, it was very, very tough because I, I didn't know whether I was going to uh, uh, come out of it, whether I was going to succeed. Mm. So when we took our flight back to Zimbabwe, I was completely hopeless. Mm. I felt really helpless. Mm. I didn't know where to start. Mm. So I came back to Zimbabwe and I informed my brothers and sisters that oh, uh, I didn't succeed, I've come back. So yeah, so walile, yeah, walile. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, you, got, you get all these kind of advices from uh, families, other, uh, others are saying, oh, uh, go and get your job back or, or look for a job in Bulawayo this time. Mm. Because the, they were very much against me working in Arada for a start mm. because of uh, family issues. So they now encouraged me to look for a job in Bulawayo. And uh, others were saying, uh, well, try again. So with, with my determination, uh, Trevor, I went back to my employer, kept in hand, mm. and I told him what had happened. Mm. And uh, fortunately, because he had always had a soft spot for me. Mm. So he, his response was, ha, 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 Albert, you thought you were clever. <laughs> <laughs> Humbling that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he said, uh, so do you want your job back? Mm. So I said, uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I want it, but I, I still want to finish uh, what I was trying to do. Mm. So he, he said, okay, go and work out what you want to do. And if you, if you want your job back, you can always come back. Mm. So I took uh, some few days. I think it took us uh, about two weeks. Uh, to reorganize with our travel agent then. Mm. And uh, we rebooked again and uh, uh, we informed my university that uh, there had been delays. And uh, my travel agent uh, 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 arranged another flight, this time to fly from uh, Arare straight up north through Egypt and straight to, to London. So that day finally came, uh, mm. Trevor, for our second attempt. Mm. This time the plane was full. There were a lot of uh, young black Zimbabweans. They were full. Mm. And uh, most of them actually were, were going for further studies. Mm. That was in 1975. Mm. So it was uneventful. We flew straight to London. Uh, my sister received me there. Again, all the arrangements were laid out. In fact, the following morning when I arrived in London, my uh, brother-in-law called uh, Dan Giovanni 
worked very hard to secure a scholarship for me. Mm. There were commonwealth scholarships for Zimbabweans, uh, young people. Mm. So we went to the home office in, uh, in, in London to see, I think uh, the man was called uh, Mr. Harper by then. Mm. So we registered there, we submit our, submitted our applications and it took us a few days and uh, I was given a scholarship. And, and th that scholarship, um, uh, Albert, what then did you study? If you could just uh, summarize for us uh, the degree, the courses that you, you decided to embark on whilst you were in England. Yeah, soon after I got that scholarship, I went straight to college to do what is called an ordinary national diploma at Wakefield College of Technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went straight into the, into the classroom. I was so green and uh, in, uh, I mean, I was so new in, uh, in the European world. And uh, we're still in that class. I was, uh, I think there were only three of us blacks. Uh, everybody was white. And uh, I mean, to go through that experience at that time, mm. it was not uh, easy. Mm. And uh, so it took me uh, two years to go through that uh, a, a diploma at Wakefield College of, of Technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, throughout the, the period within those two years, uh, we had summer holidays. Uh, the practice was summer holidays, students would uh, kind of get uh, peace jobs to supplement their, their income. Some of them uh, relied on those peace jobs actually to pay their school fees. So in my case, my school fees were already paid for. I had uh, almost sufficient scholarship fees, that pocket money that was given to me. Mm. So the peace job that I was, got, I was getting was really extra money. Mm. And again, I continued to use my trade there because those uh, uh, summer jobs, I spent them in, in, in a workshop mm. where I was doing again my jersey uh, fitting job in a, 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 fleet, a transport fleet company. And uh, again, I think uh, I, I developed a very good relationship with that company to the extent that every summer holidays, they would take me back. So I had more than enough pocket money, really, that if I wasn't strong enough, uh, uh, Trevor, I would have uh, just got carried away. Mm. Either abandoned my, uh, my studies and uh, seek employment and enjoy the life there. Mm. Uh, and I was seeing it around on my, on my fellow Zimbabwe students. They were doing all sorts of things. Others were abandoning studies and they're uh, going to full-time employment and enjoying the life there. What, what, there was what, a lot of what, where did you get that discipline, Alvord? Um, where was it coming from? How come you're keeping your head all together when everybody around you is losing their head? Talk to me about that discipline. And this is just before you do your main mechanical engineering degree, isn't it? Yes, that is before I did my mechanical engineering. Mm. Uh, I am a believer, Trevor, that in life, what you are is, uh, uh, is your upbringing, mm. is where you came from, what values were instilled in you at a young age. Mm. So really, uh, what I was doing throughout my life, I say to myself, it's not because I was clever. It's only because I had this solid, grounded values that were imparted on me right from my early age. Mm. My parents were so clear uh, about uh, how they like to bring up their children. So that discipline, that respect, that hard work remained in me throughout mm. uh, up to this day. So that is what carried me through that European jungle Mm. If I can uh, put it that way, mm. and then you acquired because, your, your then you acquired your mechanical mechanical engineering degree. Talk to us about that. Then from uh, Wakefield College of Technology, after I finished my diploma, I went to University of Sunderland.
to do my engineering degree uh, where I did my Bachelor of Science a degree in mechanical engineering uh, for, for three years. Mm. Again, uh, it was a continuation really of uh, the same focus uh, type of work where we're doing nothing else but studying, home studying. By then we were now used to be in this multi, uh, multi-colored setup. Mm. So where we had a lot of uh, students from all over the world, mm. from Greece, from uh, Iran, from uh, Denmark, uh, from, let alone from England, from Nigeria, from Sri Lanka. So it, it was now uh, uh, us getting to, to get used to it. Mm. So that is where I saw now the diversity of nationalities. Mm. But in that, a, in that diversity of nationalities, you still saw this beautiful woman, Priscilla Daminia. Um, talk to me about that. It, it's, it's a very interesting uh, romantic story there. <laughs> yeah, it's a story that will remain in my life. Uh, it was one of the weekends, I think, where we were visiting one of the relatives in hospital. Then after the hospital, we went to a house uh, of uh, one of the Zamb- Zimbabweans, uh, his name is uh, Rejoicing Tetwa. Mm. He was married to uh, a daughter of uh, Kaisa Niweni. Mm. So we went there just to, uh, as uh, Zimbabweans. Uh, uh, recently arrived, Rejoicing Tetwa was a senior uh, uh, arrival in, in England. So it was a kind of get together mm. for the Zimbabweans to get to know each other. So I was chatting with uh, Rejoicing Tetra, whom I had known uh, for many years, uh, even here in Zimbabwe. Then in front of me was set this uh, <laughs> sparkling lady. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, but there were many people there, but uh, this sparkling lady just caught my eyes in front of me there. And we kept on talking with Rejoicing. Uh, then uh, I started to uh, to initiate now the inquiries. I said to Rejoice, who is that lady? And obviously Rejoice knew her, knew her very well. When he related to me who she was, it occurred to me because uh, uh, her brother, uh, actually we were living together in Baba Fields uh-huh. uh, when we were still in secondary. And I used to see this young girl in Bulaoy at, at Baba Fields, going to the shops, and she was young. <laughs> and at that time, she didn't really take my attention. She was too young for <laughs> to, <laughs> to attract me. <laughs> but when I met her in England, now she was now a mature girl, and she had turned out to be wow, an eye catcher. And she stole your heart, Alvord. Oh yeah, when I discovered especially that who she was background wise mm. because uh, it was very important my my parents always emphasized on me what type of woman we should marry aha uh-huh. and, and, <laughs> and, and, and what, what type of woman talk to us about what type of woman <laughs> w- were you supposed to marry Albert? <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, i mean they always uh, uh, reminded us and emphasized about what type of woman we should marry and what type of women we should not marry mm. and what type of people we should uh, 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 marry into and what type of people we should not mm. and mainly it was about uh, the commonalities of cultural values mm. so they emphasize that you must marry your own people mm-hmm. because uh, there are values and traditions and cultures that must be common mm. because my parents used to say, because if you bring in a person from another tribe, we won't be able to handle their cultures. Mm. That was the main reason. Mm. So they, they were very particular about uh, maintaining our cultural values and marrying our own people mm. uh, where we had uh, uh, almost everything in common the language, uh, the, 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 the cultures, our traditions. Mm. That way they wanted to maintain it that way. Mm. Because if you go back to my maternal and uh, paternal grand, mm. 
mm. fathers who had many wives mm. each. Mm. They all married their own people mm. from the Nguni clan. So when I discovered that this Damini lady was also from our from our people and their parents actually were, were also quite particular about that. So I said to myself, I think uh, we've got all the boxes ticked here. Mm. Uh, I can go for the lady. Mm. So through Rejoicing Tetra, we, we started the correspondence. It was letter writing then. <laughs> <laughs> no, no WhatsApp. <laughs> There was no WhatsApp, no telephone, and, and all that. <laughs> yeah. So I was out there in the north of England uh, in Wakefield, and she was in London. So there was all this communication, uh, toing and froing. It took quite some time. Mm. To, to Until cut, to cut a story, a long story short, what I, what yes. I find fascinating is that when, when finally you, you, the two of you agreed that you would have a relationship, you had, agree, you had yes. an agreement in place. Talk to us about that agreement that you had in place, because for me, that's unique and very interesting. Again, uh, when uh, we started the relationship, we talked about our future. Mm. We reminded each other that uh, uh, we are here to, to study. And she also emphasized that her parents sent her to England to study. Mm. So we agreed that uh, whatever we do, we must complete our studies first and foremost. But at the same time, we agreed that ultimately we would, we would like to get married. Mm. So we decided to uh, commit ourselves to that course of action at least by getting engaged to each other. Mm. So we, we, we had this formal ceremony of an engagement where I put in a wedding ring on her finger. Mm -hmm. So from then on, she was mine and I was hers. Mm. But we, we agreed that we are not getting married until we finish our studies. Mm. And we were so clear on that and focused on that. Mm. And we went through our studies until we finished our studies, almost the same year. When we finished our studies, we agreed that we are not getting married until we get a job. Mm. And between us, we agreed that I'll go back to Zimbabwe first after my studies and look for a job and prepare the ground as it were. Once I've got that set up, then I can signal to you and you come and join me. <laughs> Very organized, Albert. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it, it, my line of thinking was quite clear mm, throughout. Mm, mm, mm. So when I got back to Zimbabwe and I got a job straight away in the railways and I kind of prepared the ground and I told all the families, my parents, that I've got a girl in England. Mm -hmm. You can imagine uh, the amount of interviews that you get subjected to. <laughs> <laughs> in, in those good old she? days, yes. yes. Who is she? <laughs> and who are her parents and that kind of stuff. Talk to me exactly. about that. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, who is she? Where does it come from? Where are her parents? Where are her brothers and sisters? As it turned out uh, during those days, when you tell your parents where you are married, mm. when they ask you those questions, one way or the other, they ultimately pick up those people. Mm. They will tell you that, oh, uh, we know those people. They come from this place. They, they come from this place. So in this case, when I told my mother, uh, she asked a lot of questions. And ultimately, she, she kind of discovered who these people are mm. uh, from their young age. She said, oh, they are from Tabazinduna. Oh, we know the, the, her mother. Well, we grew up together. Oh, they are these kind of people. So that commonality again, see, uh, started to, 
to fall into place. Mm. So uh, ultimately, uh, when uh, we, when I finally got settled there, yeah, I signaled her to come come over, mm. and uh, she finally came, and uh, she looked for a job, and after that, we then decided to get married. So we formally got married in a formal traditional way, and it was it was nice, quite lovely. Mm. So after the marriage, and uh, we agreed that uh, we are not having children yet until we get a we buy a house. Mm. Right. So I worked tirelessly to 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 buy a house. So we bought a house. Then after that, we decided that uh, now that we've got a, a house, we can now have children. Mm. At that time, again, we made this decision that we're going to have one child. Uh, and we worked on that. Ultimately, we had one child. Down the road, the, we felt pity for the child because we thought she was lonely. <laughs> we decided to have another so one. Said, yeah, so we said, I think uh, there is a case for another one. Mm. And, so and, now Albo, and, and now you've been married for how long now? Oh, 82, what, 39 years? They're about, I'm approaching years. 40 years. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. We're approaching 40 years now. <laughs> wow, we wish you many more. Let me move you on to something, Albo, that you have a lot of experience in. Uh, yes. you, in terms of boardroom experience, you, are ch you, you, you were chairman of uh, Bank ABC for nine years. You're also chairman of uh, Elfie Sells and Sons. Uh, you were on the board of TSL. You were on the board of uh, Ingwebu Breweries. You are a member of the Institute of uh, Directors. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking this, you know, what, what advice would you give to young people who are appointed to to be to, to to sit on boards. What advice would you give to them in terms of given the experience that you have harvested over the years? Yeah, that uh, has has opened my uh, my mind quite uh, substantially at that level because uh, we deal with uh, the whole diverse sectors of the economy. We deal with uh, all levels of management. Uh, we have been involved in interviewing managers and chief executives, the managing directors, etc. At that level, it needs a, a utmost maturity in handling, in handling matters, uh, particularly in separating. I call it split levels, separating between the operations of the company and uh, the, 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 the corporate decision-making level. Mm. And uh, at, at that level, you need to be quite mature and have, had, have been able to go through the meal as it were in terms of experience. Mm. We have seen said cases uh, Trevor, where some young people are either over-promoted or quickly promoted to higher positions beyond their capacity. Right. And only for them to, re, to be reminded at that level, at the chief executive level, that in fact, you haven't got what it takes to perform at this level. Mm -hmm. Either you fire the person or he remains stagnant in that position and he gets overtaken uh, by junior people uh, as time goes on. So the important thing to, uh, uh, that I would like to drive to young people is as much as possible, they should uh, get all the relevant experience as they progress, mm. not only to grow vertically, mm. but they should also grow laterally. Mm -hmm. Because as you get higher and higher, you don't need those you, you don't need to be a specialized engineer or specialized accountant. You need to be broad and understand all aspects of uh, running a business. Mm -hmm. 
Because when you get to those high levels, before you go through the roles, it will be too late for you to start learning about other disciplines. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it is very important that uh, young people must learn to grow vertically and grow laterally. Because I believe that, I've always said to these young people that all of us, if I'm an engineer, I wasn't born to, to do engineering only. Right? Whether you're an accountant or a doctor, you are not born to do that only. Mm. You are given a very powerful machine, which is the mind, mm. to be able to do just about anything if you commit yourself if you are prepared to learn. So uh, as you go up there, uh, you must be able therefore to lead other specialists in all those various disciplines. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I was fortunate enough that uh, I went through uh, all those disciplines in my training. I've got a good appreciation how other disciplines operate. Mm -hmm. And so that when you go to those high levels, you manage any discipline like any other. Mm. You can actually lead them. Mm. It's more of the leadership rather than the individual specialization of your profession. Mm. So, so with when all you this, that, you'll be leading people, mm. not just doing uh, your specialization. Mm. Sorry mm. to interrupt. No, no, great, great wisdom there, Albert. Thank, thank you for, very much for that. But I must ask you this, Albert. I mean, I'm, I look, having looked at uh, your profile and everything else, I, I'm looking, has uh, Albert ever failed? Have you ever failed on, in anything at all? Well, look, I, I, I never give up. Mm. I may have failed in, in one or two uh, occasions. But uh, I always uh, dust myself, pick myself up, and, uh, and move on and try again. Mm. So I, I think uh, you, not, uh, you, you, you can't live a life that is uh, uh, unblemished. Mm. Uh, you, 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 fail, you fail on some certain tasks, but uh, the main thing is to pick yourself up. Uh, you dust yourself up and move forward. There's many occasions when you, you come out of meetings, especially when, you, when you're chairing, and you tell yourself that, oh, I wasn't quite happy about that meeting. And uh, you, then you, you, you don't, you don't uh, give up on that. And the next time around, you seek to correct yourself. Okay. And uh, in most cases, when things are, are going right, you can actually read it from your colleagues. Mm -hmm. Because you are dealing with the mature people at that level. Mm. When things are not right, you can actually get the indications. Mm. And uh, you should always be ahead of them. Mm. Uh, we should be always uh, be able to, to give direction in any aspects. Whenever anybody is making a contribution, you must be ahead of it. Mm. When, uh, whenever there is a debate, you must be able to come up with a a solution, a direction after all that. Mm -hmm. So fail, yes, you, you, we, we do fail, but uh, I won't say there was one major case where I, I, I failed. Mm -hmm. It's uh, just the ups and downs of performances where you perfect yourself as you go on. I mean, you, if you want to be objective, you, you always analyze yourself. Did I do well there? Uh, can I uh, do better? So next time you try and improve as well. In yourself, you're, you're talking to yourself as it were. Mm. So you, you're putting yourself under pressure all the time. Mm. And, so and, you, and, and, and sorry to, to jump in there. I mean, you, you, you've been at the top for such a long time, Alvord. Uh, you know, general manager, NRZ, CEO, and eventually chairman, and now chairman of the boards that I've outlined right now. They say it's lonely at the top. Have you felt yes. lonely at the top? Uh, quite frankly, I, I, I must say I, I, I never felt lonely because mm -hmm. <clears throat> you, you, are, you are lonely if you keep yourself, if you keep to yourself. But, and yet I'm a believer that I'm there because of all these people that I'm leading below me. 
I always make sure that I reach over to people, no matter how low a position, because I always want to check things. I don't sit there in my office and get comfortable and rely on the reports that I get from those around me. Mm-hmm. I always went right down to the ground. Because uh, when I was in the railways, for example, <clears throat> I would be able to lob over, as they call it, if I want to check positions on the ground. I will not rely on my managers around me because I, I knew most of the people on the ground. I would lob over, say, to a station master in, in Bybridge or in Mutaro or Vic Falls or Chinoy, concession of, of, of plum tree, most of which I knew. Because uh, I, I used to do what I call walking the job. I used to travel the whole section and get to talk to just about everybody on their workplace, just to understand the nature of their individual jobs. So when I was sitting in, the, in my headquarters in, in, in Bulawayo, I needed to know what happened in Mutare or last night. Mm. I don't only rely on my manager next door down the corridor. I would phone straight the station master there and get it live from him. <laughs> <laughs> what does that do to your immediate subordinates who see you jumping them that way? Does that not uh, cause friction? Uh, not really, because I always uh, kept them at the edge of their seats. Mm. They knew that uh, if uh, they didn't tell me the truth, I was able to find out. Because mm. mm. uh, what, what I, I made sure is not to lob over and camp there. Uh-huh. I, you see, I just zoom in and zoom out. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, that has been my style, even up to now, uh, Trevor. If I want uh, to know a particular detail, either technically about uh, a certain area of or operation or, or a department, I, I always zoom in mm. down there and then get the picture and then zoom out. Zoom out. Yeah. This <laughs> Without being found out. <laughs> <laughs> One other thing, Alvord, thank you so much for that wisdom. You are a Rotarian. You've been a Rotarian of good standing for a long time, to the extent that you have been awarded this prestigious uh, Paul Harris Farrow Award uh, three times. Talk to me about why you do this. Right. I believe that all of us... uh, 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 were given God, uh, God-given attributes. Uh, we are in this world not to work for our stomachs only. Mm. And uh, there is so much we can do at minimum cost, minimum effort that can change other people's lives. Example is uh, all of us, in, if you go to your, to your house, to your bedroom, to your wardrobes, We have accumulated a lot of junk over the years. And in some cases, if you you go on a holiday, some cases your wife buys a lot of nice things out there. They get picked up in the the drawers, stays there for years without being used, only to discover that, oh, some two, three, four years back, we bought this is still not used. So what I'm saying is we've got a lot of extra junk, a lot of extra capacity, a lot of uh, extra advice that we can share with uh, the less privileged members of our society. Mm -hmm. So Rotary is about passion. Rotary is about uh, improving other people's lives. Rotary is about uh, assisting those members of society who are less fortunate than ourselves. Mm. So we give up our time, our resources to a lot of projects that will assist and in many cases change lives of the less fortunate members of our society. 
and with things like your weather, be it in education, be it in health, be it in uh, water and sanitation, etc. So we get together as Rotarians. This is an international organization with uh, 1.2 million members where we mobilize our resources and our efforts and identify the needy members of our society and they help them out. Mm -hmm. This is all what we are about. Mm -hmm. uh, we take up uh, our spare time where we meet every week, once a week, to decide what can we do, where, where is this needs of society, what can we mobilize, uh, what can we perhaps uh, do with a partnering with other clubs all over the world. Mm -hmm. So throughout the years, we have done a lot of projects in Matebele, either in schools or rural communities, etc. And uh, some cases uh, providing scholarships for students I mean, right now, there's a lot of uh, students that were put through the, they have graduated the school. It's effectively changing their, their life. Mm. You will re realize or recall that uh, because of the way of life in Zimbabwe, in rural areas in particular, we've got a lot of children, especially at schools, who are under the care of their grandmothers, mm. helpless grandmothers, who have got no resources at all. So you can imagine how much help those mothers need uh, to support the needs of this grandchild under her care. Mm. So in those cases, we move in and assist those children at least define a path mm. in life for them. Mm. Talk so to me that about, don't, that, yes. That's awesome stuff. Talk to me about what that, the satisfaction for you as Alvord, where, 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 where does it come from? Yeah, I, I, it is, I see myself playing a major contribution, national contribution mm. in the, the human uh, human uh, development of this country. Mm. There are a lot of uh, young children that we have assisted through schools who otherwise would have dropped out. Mm. We work out with schools and providing the facilities which otherwise they would have. Mm. Because uh, uh, our government, like any other, they haven't got all the resources sure. that they need for their schools and hospitals. So we're filling in those gaps where the government falls short. I mean, like any responsible citizen, if you go to a school, either they have got no libraries or they need computers or they, they need uh, market gardening or they need the role models for that matter. Mm. Because you, you, you will be addressing school children and they're opening up all like a 30 year roadmap for them. You are putting heads up to them so that mm. as they grow up, they have got role models. They have got something to look forward to, mm. in addition to supporting them in their educational needs. Mm. You, and you, there's, there's you, a lot of them that we have supported who are now in the managerial positions today. Fantastic. You you were involved at a technical level, um, Alvord, uh, with the Matebel and Zabezi water project. I see that last week uh, when President Mnangagwa visited Wulawayo, uh, there yes. seems to be some movement. Are you hopeful in terms of, uh, is this finally going to get traction? Uh, briefly, what are your views then? Yeah, Trevor, the, the Matibere and Water Project was first mooted, as we all know, in 1912. Mm. Right. And uh, I think uh, in my earlier discussion, I talked about us as a nation falling short on uh, on vision, mm -hmm. falling short on, on implementation. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of projects that uh, we have talked about over the years, a lot of projects that uh, have fallen by the wayside, all because we never 
handled them seriously. We never invested sufficiently. We never took a long-term view of it. So it is now difficult for anybody to believe that this time round is going to happen. Right. We are not doubting uh, the sincerity of the president, but we have to go through this process of convincing these mm. people that this time is going to happen. Mm. Because the uh, expectations have remained for years and years. And the people now firmly believe that, oh, we've heard about that before. So for, for them to believe, they want to believe by seeing mm. it's delivery. Well, well, what is it that, you, that would convince you now that things are different, uh, Alvord, in terms of uh, that seeing by, by believing? What is it Alvord would want to see to believe that this time things are different? I mean, in everything else, uh, Trevor, I, we believe in action. We believe in results. Mm. We believe in delivery. Mm. Just that. Mm. Deliver. Mm. Deliver. Mm. So when they talk of MZW demo or Shangani White demo or the pipeline, or whether I would talk of anything else, the railways or anything else, talk is nice. Mm. But please, we want delivery. Mm. We want the results. Yeah. So we will believe when things are happening, we will believe when that completed projects begin to touch people's lives because ultimately that is what matters mm. you may complete that project if it's not touching people's lives if it's not improving the quality of people then we still are not doing anything mm. the whole thing is about improving the quality of life of our people I get the amount of poverty that we still have in this country, it's just not acceptable. Mm. Mm. Wow. Um, one other project that you've been involved in, and I know you're very passionate about this one, so I'm going to ask you to be as brief as you, as you may. You, you've been right. chairman, I think this means a lot to you, Albert, again, uh, since 2003 of the uh, Mangwe Farmers and Safari Hunters Association. What does this mean to you? Um, and and where, where, where are the opportunities uh, for the country uh, and, 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 and the region? As briefly as you may, please. Yeah, I, I think, uh, as I say, wherever I get involved for my sin, I end up being put on the front line. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, using the, the train metaphor, you, you're right there pulling the carriages, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how it ends up as in the, in the final analysis. The Mangue Farmers Association, we are a group of farmers, about 17 of us uh, in that area, where we got together and decided that in addition to our uh, livestock, cattle ranching business, we also have to run uh, the, the, the safari operation. So we got together, drew up a constitution, put up a management structures, and uh, of which I am leading. Mm. And uh, we, we agreed on the method of operations. And uh, then we agreed on linking up with the national uh, departments that are associated with it, like uh, the, the national parks, for example. And uh, we link up with the, the safari hunting industry, which is the the professional hunters themselves. And uh, we link up also with the international clients mm. uh, where we bring them in as the season progresses. Mm. So I'm managing that whole thing of uh, uh, bringing in or marketing ourselves first internationally mm. and identifying clients out there from Europe, whether it's Spain or America or wherever. Uh, they come in and do the, the hunting. We build, we build the safari camps. In fact, the camp is, is in my farm. So we manage it with the professional hunters as well. And then we do the hunting. We also manage, the critical part of it is to manage the game. Mm. To make sure that uh, 
the game is protected, to make sure that the game is given enough time to breed, because you've got a spe specified beginning of the hunting season and end of the hunting season. And the method of working is all defined. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, we have got uh, defined quarters as well. Every creature, every animal, whether it's a bird, there's no really need shooting. Mm -hmm. The professional hunters know how many of these per year they can shoot. Mm -hmm. And everything that is shot has to be accounted for. Mm -hmm. And every animal, anything that is shot, there's a rate that is specified. Whether you shoot a, a, a leopard or you shoot a kudu or a zebra, wildebeest, there are rates that are specified. There are quotas also that are specified. Mm -hmm. So the whole process is so managed that the income also is uh, uh, pooled together. And we've got a treasurer that manages the income part of it, which uh, at the end of each season, uh, we share between ourselves as farmers and pay also our game scouts that are on the ground. Mm. So the project what, has been... what, what impact has the COVID lockdown had on, on that conservation pro project, hunting project, tourism project? What, what uh, impact has COVID had? Disastrous. Mm. Because uh, literally everything has come to a standstill. The clients can't fly in because, uh, as you know, the, 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 uh, the, the flights have mm -hmm. been cancelled. So no operations can uh, 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 happen at all. So this season has been a complete standstill. No hunting. All the bookings that were made were cancelled because we made bookings in advance. Mm -hmm. So all the bookings that were made were cancelled. Mm. You can uh, feel sorry for, say, the professional hunters. That's their source of livelihood. Yeah. So they have had no income this year. So all the bookings now have been cancelled. We are waiting for the regulations in case they will be relaxed, and uh, we start uh, our hunting operations. Mm. Uh, if uh, if everything was normal, we we'll would be starting about this this time of year mm. march will be starting next month our hunting operations but mm. because everything is closed down there is nothing happening in fact it's going to have a downstream effect on us on our livestock side mm. because uh, because we are not harvesting the game the game is continuing now to increase this population so that will now bring pressure on our pastures. Mm. What, what, would you have, what would you have the government do, uh, Alvord? Is there anything that the government can do to alleviate what you're talking about? I think we need to accelerate all the efforts that are being made on this COVID front to make sure that uh, uh, all the vaccines that are being talked about uh, are brought in in large enough numbers to make a difference, to make sure that uh, people are, uh, the life in general is made safe. Mm. I think uh, until that is done, we'll continue to be in, in this precar precarious position. Mm. So the, the, the more we accelerate the processes, the more we open up as a country, the more we open up as the entire international community, to allow business to start operating once again. Yeah. Only then now can we start uh, living a normal life. Albert, you, you, you're aware that uh, the people that follow this uh, show uh, every week, love books. And uh, the one thing that you've done that I absolutely love is the fact that you have written a book uh, about the journey that you have um, been blessed to, uh, to undertake in, in, in life. Somebody has said that uh, there's a book in each one of us, but not all of us have the discipline and the courage to sit down and write. You have sat down and written a book, uh, and the book is called 
Alvord Mabena, The Man and His Roots. Uh, I'm sure you've got a copy there. Um, yeah, this is it. Right, lift it up a bit more, a bit more. Wow, beautiful, beautiful. I wish yeah. each one of us, particularly our business leaders and politicians, would have the discipline that you have. So here's the question, Alvord. Why did you write that book? Yeah, it's simple. Again, as I say, I always project the future. Mm. It, I say to myself, 50 years down the road, what will be, uh, my next generation know about my life, my generation, my parents, my grandparents? Zero. Mm -hmm. Because Trevor, I was born in uh, Fort Rickson, Emma Kanden, as it was. Grew up in, in Berlingue and uh, lived a life in, in town in Bulawayo and studied in the UK. My grandchild was born in the UK. 50 years down the, uh, down the line, how will those people put things together? How will they connect? Because when I was uh, uh, trying to know from my parents about my history, I used to say, how did my grandfather look like? How did my great-grandfather look like? How, where did they come from? They knew nothing about it. <laughs> they knew nothing about it. So I decided that I have to document something while I'm still alive. Mm. Uh, as much as I can get, at least leave it behind so that mm. my grandchildren will take it up from there, will have to trace that uh, the, once upon a time they existed our grandparents and uh, these are their pictures. You know, Trevor, in the African culture some time back, if a, an old person died, whether it's your father or mother, the practice was to remove all the pictures, the photographs from the walls and destroy them. Throw them together <laughs> in the, uh, as, you, as you bury them. Yes, they, they, it was taboo mm. to leave them there. So I felt very bad that I didn't have a picture of my father, let alone of my grand, grandfather, mm -hmm. because they were all destroyed. So I said, I, I must uh, recreate that history, that legacy, that connection. Mm -hmm. So I said, uh, I, I think I need to document something. Mm -hmm. So I engaged a, a renowned uh, a, a historian and we started on this journey of writing this book, where we traveled the entire Tabelaland uh, to wherever there was an old person that existed to interview them. Mm. Then we went to as far as South Africa as well. We went through all the libraries, we went through all the internet, and we researched all the uh, literature in South Africa to try and connect and we produced a, a family tree mm. that traces us back, I think, to about 1400s. Wow. <laughs> wow. Then, uh, the, only then did we establish how we connect with the Mabenas in South Africa, wow. because there's all that line there. Mm. And not only my Mabena side, but from my wife's side as well. Mm. It's a huge family tree. So that wherever you meet Emma Bena or Germany, anywhere in the, in the country, uh, you ask a few questions, you can locate them in that family tree. Wow. So we, we wrote quite a lot of chapters uh, from these interviews that we were making. But uh, if I go through these pictures now, about 90% of the uh, old people that we interviewed then are dead now. Mm. And it occurs to me now that if we, had, if we had missed the chance, they would have gone with all that information. Oh, wow. You see, which mm. is sad. But at least now, I've got them, their pictures as well, all the their stories. history. Mm. Yes, their so story. Me, tell me, so where do we get that book? Uh, is it available on Amazon, uh, in the shops? Where do we get it? Yeah, two things. 
I, I still have got some copies, but you can also get them uh, on Amazon, Trevor. Mm -hmm. uh, it's available. It's going for 10, 10 US dollars a copy. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if, uh, if you want a copy as well, I can uh, make uh, uh, a couple of them available uh, to you. Absolutely. But one thing that, that interested me, Trevor, is one thing that interested me during this exercise is when we were interviewing the, our oldest people that were still alive, trying to scoop from them mm. how much of history... Download as it were. Download as it were. <laughs> Yes, to download, yes, literally. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Only to discover that they are so, so, so shallow. Because they were born only yesterday. Mm. My father was born 1912. Most of them were born in the late 1990s, mm. uh, 1919 or uh, in the 20s. But what I needed was going way, way back. Mm. Uh, during the life of our, um, our grandparents, the great grandparents, mm. and they knew nothing about it. Wow! So we had to rely now on uh, libraries and uh, researching archives. from internet, yeah, and archives, etc. Mm. Mm. So it occurred to me that uh, we are so ignorant about ourselves, oh. and yet uh, we are such a big nation. Mm. <laughs> wow! And, uh, so that uh, it's important that we document these things because our future generation won't have any legacy, won't have any connection mm -hmm. with their rich past mm -hmm. if we don't leave anything behind for them. Mm -hmm. So I'm satisfied that, that I've got something that they can latch on. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Alvord, for, for that. And I'm sure our viewers, uh, our followers all over the world will be going on to Amazon to, to get that book. Well done for doing that. And I'm sure you've inspired a lot of other people to write the book. Albert, thank you so much for creating the time to join us on In Conversation with Trevor. Don't go away, remain there. Allow me to address myself now to our viewers who watch this show every day. We are out uh, on Monday, every week rather, every Monday, every week, uh, we are a weekly show. Uh, thank you, all, all, for all of you in Zimbabwe, in the diaspora, all over the, sh the world who watch this, uh, this show. To ensure that you don't miss out on this show, I invite you to click on this button here so that you get uh, an alert every time we have one of these uh, quality conversations. So until next time, cheers to you all.